Um, you kind of touched on this a bit, but if you could just talk a little bit more about how uh, eco towns kind of relate to the wider scheme of uh, kind of like the big big society, big community. Um. Well, I guess the, the, you have to question why, you know, first of all, why do you need that number of houses? Um, and we were told two things. One was that there was a need to um, um, look after the local population. Yeah? Families are getting um, smaller in that people are, are splitting and, and not staying together as long as they used to uh, uh, years ago. Um, so therefore, houses are, households are smaller. Um, people are living longer. Um, and there is a need, therefore, to ensure that there, um, that there are houses for the population that is um, organic, if you like, for, for that particular area. Um, however, the, we do get um, slightly um, perplexed by the leader of, of, of Broadland District Council. He keeps banging on about the need to have um, houses um, for the people on the housing list. He talks about affordable housing, which has got three elements to it. Socially rented houses, um, for, usually for housing associations. Houses that are 50-50, uh, uh, rent and buy, and houses that are just below market value. Um, we asked him how many of the affordable houses would be socially rented uh, at a public statement. He said all of them, because he didn't really know. Turns out it's not one of them at all. It's quite a small percentage of the, of the houses that would be built would actually be available to rent. And when you then look at the number of one bedroom and two bedroom for the young people he's so concerned about on the housing waiting list then it's a, it's a tiny number um, but you know we, we understand the need for, for that um, so he keeps um, uh, banging that particular drum we also have questioned the difference between housing want and housing need um, and in fact we've got members who have applied to go on the local housing list and have got their own houses and they've been accepted so you have to take numbers um, you know, uh, um, with a pinch of salt. Um, and that, that whole um, premise of, of providing houses for local people is, is why the council need, need to build houses. But they also have taken the, the fact that East Anglia and Norfolk has got inward migration from other parts of the country, and indeed from outside of the country. And therefore there's a need. And, and that's the real... Uh, or one of the real challenges is to get that forecasting right because forecasting is a very um, inexact science um, and uh, if you if you are able to forecast as accurately as what they think they can you wouldn't be doing that job you'd be you know um, doing something else and, and making good use of that forecast technique so we've got the inorganic growth and the organic growth of the of the population which is why you need the houses the equal part of it. Um, I think is, is, is just greenwashed. As I said before, all houses in 2015 are going to be at a level of sustainability called level six, where um, they, they will have to be a certain standard. So the eco label means nothing other than uh, an opportunity to bypass planning laws and an opportunity to uh, promote one's uh, professionalism, shall we say, by being the first district council to have a, an eco town on their doorstep. But if you, as I said earlier, if you look at the actual plans and compare them with true eco communities in in uh, on mainland Europe, then um, it, it doesn't stack up. I mean, greenwash is is something that's used in commerce these days. Uh, every opportunity, um, I've I've come across it in, in in all sorts of areas where people will use the green tag um, because it's it's convenient. Um, they think it's um, pandering to a certain consumer group that um, that like that type of product or, or, or service. You, know, you get green services these days. Um, yes, and there is a need. Uh, if you then bring in the whole climate change um, agenda, it, get, it all starts to get very complex. Um, we all recognise that the population of the world is growing um, and the resources are, are reducing, both, both financially and non-financially. Um, and I, I'm, I'm a great champion of sustainability, but when it's done properly and, and it's, it's backed up with fact and evidence, um, rather than just 
opportunities taking advantage of the green label and pushing through things or trying to push through things that wouldn't be palatable without that label um, so that's what I think uh, greenwash is all about and, and you, one has to be very careful I think that um, you're not sucked into that whole environmental thing uh, and therefore make the wrong choices in, in goods or services that you buy because you think you're buying something that that you're actually not. So it's you know it's the old you know buyer beware syndrome. It's like anything that you buy, you have to check it out. And if you're happy with it and satisfied with it, then then fine. Um, but take it all with a pinch of salt, because there are some people out there who are using that label for convenience. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about, or anything? Um, yeah, I think it's worth mentioning that um, I. We, I, I mentioned uh, earlier on the joint core strategy, which was this um, strategy that the four councils have, have uh, developed to uh, build these houses, these thousands of houses in um, in this particular area. Um, the well, how the, the, that actual document was put before local councils um, in February this year. And despite the fact that there was legal opinion that it was legally unsound. Now, what does that mean, legally unsound? At the end of the day, it's um, one person's opinion. However, this was a barrister, barrister's opinion who specialised in planning. And he um, had been engaged by another group of people, nothing to do with snub. It was a, a developer who wanted to develop alternative plans. However, um, he pass a, a legal opinion that this was unsound and, and justified why it was unsound and we read that and we we thought that well that's a piece of uh, free legal advice that you know on the surface looks looks legitimate um, but however the planners still um, put this to council um, to full council meeting not the planning committee for the joint core strategy to be adopted and to be submitted to central government government even knowing it was unsound and knowing that there was a chance there was a chance that it would be um, called in and lo and behold they submitted this joint core strategy in in, in march um, of this year and the it was called in by the planning inspector the planning inspector then had a public meeting to uh, uh, what they call a preliminary meeting before a full public hearing um, and that was in um, May and he found 80 reasons why the joint core strategy was not not sound so as well as the legal definition of being sound there were also 80 other reasons why he wouldn't pass that joint core strategy. Now, you think about the implications of that. 80 reasons why that joint core strategy was rejected. And as a consequence, they've now um, thrown it back to the councils, the four councils that formed the Great Knights Development Partnership, um, and said, I'm sorry, you have to think again. So the whole cost and the expense of doing that um, has been a waste of money. Now, the fact that they submitted that, knowing that it was there was a high chance that it was going to be thrown out, to me smacks of, of well, it's immoral, I think, if not certainly unprofessional. Um, and um, I think one of the reasons the Broadland District Council threw out the planning application on Tuesday was because they knew, and in fact, in my speech, I made the point that a lot of the policies that were linked to the planning application were in the joint core strategy, which had been rubbished. Um, and they knew, I think, that the planning officers had tried to pull the wool over their eyes, to coin a phrase, and that actually the um, joint court, they knew the joint court strategy wouldn't get through, but they, the councillors trusted the professional judgment of the planners. And I think this was their opportunity to push that back and say, no, we're not, we're not accepting what you say anymore because you told us a joint court strategy would get through, but it didn't. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's our names, our necks in, in line, because this is all submitted in the council's name. You're not councillors, we are. So I think there was a bit of a pushback there. So that could be quite interesting. And now we have to, um, we are working with the planning inspector to um, make sure that 
the community's views are put forward um, and we will see what happens when it's resubmitted in um, September.